We want to say a very special welcome to Ericsson's wife has arrived, Didi. We're so glad to have you and bless you. And again, I know you have so much free time, so if you would like to chat about anything of life or music or the Bible, I would be so happy to do that, especially if you buy the coffee. It goes a long way. <laughs> to grace. It's a way to grace. <laughs> Well, yesterday we read the entirety of Daniel chapter 9, so this morning we're just going to get right into various bits of the text that are all focused on the radical praying of Daniel. So have your Bibles ready and open again to Daniel chapter 9. We're not going to read it, I'm just going to refer to specific verses to save uh, the time. So have your Bibles open, either a a book Bible or a, well, you don't have your mobile, so don't worry about that. (laughs) But just the Bible in front of you and any notes you want to take. Similarly, yesterday, we dealt entirely with various uh, contextual elements. That is what surrounds this prayer. The impact of the potency of this prayer really determined a lot by this uh, contextual Uh, elements that we looked at yesterday. And today, then, we finally get to the prayer itself. And in this process of study, I'd like to propose that we ask two simple questions throughout uh, this look at Daniel 9 and the prayer itself. One, what do we learn from the content of this prayer? And two, why should radical disciples pray like this? What do we learn from the content? Why should radical disciples pray in this manner? To begin with, I think this prayer offers us something quite significant in how it focuses on God on the one hand and on supplicants, meaning those praying, those beseeching him, on the other. And as we give attention to all that this prayer has to say about God himself, we can see that they all come under the category of descriptors of being in reference to God, or what some scholars refer to as descriptors of action in reference to God. Those that describe God in his being and those that describe God via his actions. So in verse 4, for example, we read, yesterday I helped you with my seminary professor's adage, put your finger in the text. So look at verse 4 with your finger right there. We read that God is described as great and awesome. And his descriptive actions are highlighted as covenant keeping and also loving kindness keeping, which is the rich, by the way, the rich Hebrew word chesed that appears all through the Old Testament, meaning keeping grace, God acting toward us on on the basis of grace. So if I require you to buy me a coffee in order to receive something from me, that's not grace. (laughs) Grace is I just freely give it because I love you. So I take that back. I'll buy you a coffee. (laughs) And then in verse 7, finger into verse 7, we are encouraged to understand God as the one to whom righteousness belongs. Do you see that? Verse 7, righteousness belongs to thee, O Lord. And further down in verse 9, understanding God as the one to whom compassion and forgiveness belong. But it all comes together in how such descriptors, 
of being and descriptive actions inform the plea that we come to in verse 17, the supplicant's plea. O Lord, verse 17, let thy face shine on thy desolate sanctuary. The desolate sanctuary is a designation of worshiping people, a sanctuary who are rendered desolate because they are in exile. They are in a foreign land. They are under an oppressive hegemonic regime called the Babylonians. But the cry to let thy face shine is what gives this all very real great significance. So that, for example, Gerhard von Rad, a very renowned Old Testament scholar, suggests that this notion of the face of God shining forth is an Hebraic idea that is about how God's own character actually impacts human behavior. As it speaks of the emanating character of God shining forth like sun rays emanating from the sun. In other words, God's own character displayed in his worshiping people. That's what this prayer is asking. Let thy face shine forth on this desolate sanctuary. In spite of this exilic condition, in spite of all the challenges to what it means to live in such a world that is opposed to God in so many ways, let your character shine through this people who worships you. And what are those characteristics? Well, precisely those listed descriptive actions of God, not the descriptors of being that are God's alone, but descriptive actions that can be emulated and even in a sense mimicked by worshiping people. If you are truly a worshiper of God, you should be becoming like him, taking on his character, what he cares for, what he values, what he thinks is important ought to so be shaping you because your worship of him is drawing you in such proximity to the God of all creation. Thus, in this list that we have of God's descriptive actions, promise keeping, grace-based behavior, righteous living, compassion, and forgiveness are all listed as actions of God. As we focus on God in such praying, these very characteristics are to become our own as the worshiping people of God. Of course, never perfectly. We're human. We have sin, which we'll get to in this prayer in just a moment. But as we aspire to worship God, we take on his characteristics, and our praying ought to promote that. Prayer, then, for radical disciples goes way beyond perfunctory as its purpose and goal is rather formational, meaning character formation. If you and I are worshiping God, or at least professing to worship God, but we are not taking on his characteristics, something is really amiss. And if we're praying towards God, but his character is not shaping us formationally, it's telling you something is not in order. Is your praying forming the character of God in you? When we turn to the supplicants, on the other hand, again, 
the terms of this prayer of Daniel are at once informative, indicative, and certainly challenging. The first descriptor of the supplicants comes to us in verse 4, back to your finger in verse 4, rendered simply as, as we read, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and loving kindness. And here's the first descriptor of us for those who love him. You see that in verse 4? For those who love him. I want to remind us all that this is not at all incidental. No, rather I am convinced that it is at the heart of real radical discipleship. Someone who passionately loves God will be a radical disciple. Unadorned but passionate love for God. Simple but ardent love for God is in the blood of any radical disciple. This is why, by the way, Jesus, when he restores Peter, the disciple who denied him three times, what does he ask of Peter? He doesn't say, do you understand me? He doesn't say, do you get my program? He doesn't even say, do you know me? He says, do you love me? Love for God, for Jesus, is at the heart of radical discipleship. Those who love him. The second descriptor of the supplicants follows right on, doesn't it, in verse 4? As those who not only love him, but keep his commandments. Verse 4, the very end. This is getting at, obviously, obedience to God, isn't it? For love of God followed by and perhaps expressed in obedience to God. In terms of theological integrity, love for God without obedience to God would be mere persona and at that empty and hollow religious showmanship. For in true biblical standards, obedience is the proof of love when it's directed toward God. And finally, the third description of sincere supplicants, and the only one that is self-described, comes to us in verse 17. Skip over to verse 17, where Daniel, as supplicant, refers to himself as Avdekah. Your servant, Avdika, very pronounced in Hebrew. And it harkens back to verse 6, in which the same designation is afforded even the venerable prophets of old. They are the servants, Avdika, your servants, O God. This is a prayer invoking a very certain self-awareness of exilic disciples, that of servanthood. My wife likes to say, well, make me a servant is a wonderful song. We love to sing it, but it's really hard when you're actually required to serve see your life in a posture of servanthood. There's so many examples of that here to Chehi in every aspect, but I want to really highlight that that's what I see in those who come to this place as counselors. It's just serving. Serving, serving, 
They're there for you to serve you. It's a radical discipleship. But I have to say, when I look at the three of these, love for God, obedience to God, servanthood, the face of somebody you've heard about a lot around here recently, Dr. Sam Shu, just is the picture of all of that. Love for God, obedience to God servanthood. Summer before he died, I was with Sam here at Chehi. We shared an apartment space, <clears throat> so I had lots of late night talks, and he told me one time that he had been invited to a company at the Hollywood Bowl in Los Angeles to accompany Yo-Yo Ma, the great cellist. But it conflicted with the dates of Chehi's Summer School of Music, and he turned it down. I have to go serve. He loves God. He loves obedience to God. Dr. Shu. Well, now we have to go on to more of the content of this what we could call a pedagogical prayer, a teaching prayer. And it's kind of a tough bit now. But I think we cannot miss that this prayer does not duck the difficult issue of sin and shame and confession. Verse 5 Verse 5, finger in the text, does not hesitate in the slightest, but addresses it squarely, doesn't it? And quite extensively, as Daniel prays, we have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly, rebelled, even turning aside from thy commandments and ordinances. I read that and I think, well, just stop at sin. We have sinned. But he goes on, committed iniquity acted wickedly, rebelled, turned aside from your commandments. He wants to make the point, this is serious, isn't it? As he prays to God. No, I well know that sin is not an in vogue subject to entertain and that in vogue Bible communicators are constrained to either avoid it or redefine it. As for example, the honest take of a very good scholar in England, Alan Mann in Bristol, England, a few years ago, writing an entire book entitled Atonement for a Sinless Society. And the very real need, he contends, not to make assumptions in terms of cultural understanding or the lack of it or the rejection of it when it comes to sin. But the Bible's very real tackling of the essence for sin, as, for example, Luther defined it as homo incurvates in se, humanity curved in on itself, is the essence of sin. Homo incurvates in se is both ever-present and ever-changing reality of human behavior in the Bible. So that I'm convinced that radical discipleship is defined at least in part by both acknowledging sin and dealing with sin, yes, sensitively, but honestly. In theological language, it is referred to as hamartiology, missing the mark of the standard of the glory of God, the study of sin. And I personally think that in the coming years across the West, a serious approach to hamartiology is going to be more and more the pressing need for anyone who wants to actually be a radical disciple to not shy away from 
prayers like Daniel, we have sinned. This is all the more the case because of how sin is in, inexorably related to shame. So often in the Bible, and as we see here in verse 8 in this prayer, it directly addresses it. Verse 8, open shame belongs to us, O Lord, to our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we all, we have sinned against thee. How do we deal with this sort of acknowledgement before God when sin is all but discounted in postmodern life and shame is decried in most circles as therapeutically abhorrent? Perhaps verse 8 can actually help us even if it also offends us because of its directness, calling it not just shame, but open shame. Leaning on the Hebrew, bosheth hapanim. Literally, bosheth hapanim translated confusion of the face. Bosheth is confusion Hapanim, panim is the Hebrew for face, the face. Thus face such that it is public or open, but confusion so that it might suggest a human reaction, but not one that is necessarily advocated by God, so that it is perhaps getting at sin, which can become so exacerbated that it eventuates in social confusion, even self-shaming confusion. Where God perhaps never expects shame, but certainly the admission of guilt, two different things. But open shame is the societal confusion about it so that guilt becomes shame that leaves you with nowhere to go. But all of this clearly calls for one and only one response, and that is the very necessary discipline, spiritual discipline, that I really implore you take seriously and think about. So many of our churches kind of avoid it, but I think there's a, a place uh, both in personal spirituality, but also in the liturgic traditions of our worship to confess, confess our sin. That's what this text is emphasizing. We see in verse four and five, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. Verse five, we have sinned. And verse 20, in the aftermath, as Daniel is describing his experience now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel. I think, based on such a passage as this, that radical discipleship, that is demonstrated in radical praying fully embraces the place of sincere confession. Radical discipleship requires, I think, more and more an abhorrence for the devastating power of sin. And then finally, as we finish up this morning, the prayer concludes with something that is unbelievably intriguing and powerful and radical. This prayer so ingeniously focuses on something really quite astounding, on prayer for God's sake. It's the climactic request that also concludes the prayer in verse 19. Did you catch it? Put your finger in verse 19. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen, take action for thine own sake. O oh my God. 
prayer for God's sake. It most certainly relates back to verse 15, in which the very name of God is liable, we might say, to the behavior of his people. And now, O Lord, our God, who has brought thy people out of the land of Egypt, Egypt with a mighty hand and has made a name for thyself, as it is this day, we have sinned, we have been wicked. God's own reputation is at stake in the world based on the behavior of his people. And so the prayer comes to its dramatic conclusion, verse 19, O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, listen, take action for thine own sake, O my God. This young women and men is radical praying in the most bold manner as prayer for God's sake. Not prayer for your own sake, not a particular need's sake, not even a particular crisis sake, but for God's sake. This is a far cry from the self-focused praying that is almost entirely about personal therapy that is the standard fare of average believers. But this is radical praying in the interest of God's purposes, God's heartbeat, God's kingdom on this earth for thine own sake. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven for God's sake. that bespeaks radical, exilic discipleship as practiced by a man like Daniel. And perhaps as practiced by someone like you, like me, like Sam Shu. like these counselors, these teachers, these staff who are here, I believe, because they love God, they obey God, and they're servants. Jesus, thank you for Daniel's prayer. We confess today our sin. I confess my sin, that self-centered, that in cravates, that turning in on myself, that it's all about me. I pray that you would remove that. I repent of that in myself, and I repent of that with these sisters and brothers. Help us to be disciples radically. And we pray now for your sake, for your purposes, your kingdom, your character, forming and fashioning us as we Pray like Daniel. In the name of Jesus. Amen.